Matt Smith had a lot to prove as David Tennant's successor. Top 2 had been taken to one of its popularity highs, and with RTD vacating the showrunner chair, change was on the way for Doctor Who once again. A brand new decade would see Doctor Who taken to worldwide popularity. And an emphasis on fantasy and interconnected storytelling. What are the best stories this era has to offer? Let's find out. At the very, very, very bottom, we have... Number 39, Asylum of the Daleks. No, I didn't announce the winner first by mistake. You didn't skip towards the end of the video. This is without a doubt the worst 11th Doctor story ever, and it's so bafflingly bad I don't even know where to begin. The idea of unhinged Daleks is pretty cool, but basing this on Daleks' inability to extinguish divine hatred may sound thematically deep, but it's about as artificial as eating fresh air when Daleks killing each other is a precedent in other stories. Furthermore, the titular asylum makes no sense. Why have the force field only be turned off on the planet where the insane inmates are? You might as well give a prisoner the key to their own cell. But to top that off, Oswin the Dalek can wipe the memories of the Doctor from the Daleks, thus making the whole asylum set up pointless. Wow, yay! Speaking of Daleks forgetting the Doctor, I can't wait to see all the great things they do with this plot element. I'm sure it won't get dropped like the brand new Paradigm Daleks. Oh, and I haven't even gone to the utter trash that is the Pond's divorce. It comes out of nowhere and it's completely forgotten about for the rest of the series. Was it only there to give Amy and Rory something to do? Asylum of the Daleks is bad on every level. Its characters are bad. Its plot is bad. Its story is bad. Its fan service is bad. How bad is this story out of 10? Let's say 39. Or 11. Number 38. Journey to the Centre of the TARDIS. I debated putting this or Asylum of the Daleks as the worst, and whilst the latter may infuriate me, this episode just bores me. This is a hollow, illogical confusion of unoriginal ideas featuring some of the worst guest performances in the series' long history. This is far from Dot's Who's Finest Hour. Exploring the depths of the TARDIS is a cool idea, but all we get is generic corridors that do nothing for the imagination. Don't even get me started on the wooden performances from the Free Salvage Men, because I might get nasty, but their efforts make an already hollow story venture into the realms of utter unwatchability. All three of them are completely unsympathetic. A man who convinced his brother that he was an android because he was always his dad's favourite? Even if there was a screamingly convincing motive, a powerfully written and acted relationship that we were emotionally invested in, and enough time to reasonably explore this idea, it would still be extremely hard to buy. You only have to think about the tricky twist for one moment to realise that it doesn't make a lick of sense. He might have lost his memory of his life, but for he was convinced that he was an android, but how does that explain his need to eat or his ability to sleep either, or how he perspires or why he anything? might just be the stupidest man to ever appear in the series. That is before you start to probe the psychological madness of why his brother would ever try and convince him that he's an android. Seriously, why would you ever do such a thing over a long period of time? What could possibly motivate this kind of obscene identity theft? The story promises to develop into the impossible girl arc for Clara, but nah, we don't need that. Let's reset everything by the end. It's so backwards. For being a dull as dishwater runaround, this episode should be stripped down for scrap. It'd be hard to find anything worthy here. Number 37. The Doctor, the Widow and the Wardrobe. I'm amazed Stephen Moffat wrote not only my favourite Christmas special, but also what I consider the worst. A fatigue writer trying to out Christmas his previous year, and he ends up dousing the series in syrup and producing one of the least effective scripts in the show's 60 plus year history. There is no point where Doctor Who should be this unengaging, this tired, this lethargic in its attempts to impress and wow the viewer. This reduced to cliché and sentimentality and this lacking in incident, relatable characters and memorable moments. This could be held up as the cure for insomnia or the piece of television to be studied by those who are entering into the medium to warn of how not to make a Christmas special. I hate how horribly self-knowing the show was during this period taking everything for granted and refusing to present anything as fresh or original. Wait, that's because nothing here is fresh or original. It's a hackney piece of old sci-fi rubbish that visual equivalent of watching paint dry over a millennium and about as creative as a lecture entitled The History of Glue. 
pop the window and the wardrobe may have all the ingredients of Christmas, but is being put together by someone who fundamentally doesn't quite know how to pull off the festivities. There is barely anything to recommend here, unless I have trouble going to sleep. Number 36. Nightmare in Silver. I apologise for any Series 7 fans, but it's not my fault most of the worst stories got all crammed into one series. Acclaimed writer Neil Gaiman giving the Cyberman a reboot? This has to be the markings of a classic, right? So I'm just scratching my head as to what the hell went wrong here. It's one of those rare Doctor Who stories where nothing seems to be working, where the director and the writer seem to be coming at the story from entirely different angles. As far as I'm concerned, Neil Gaiman has completely failed to understand the core strength behind the idea of the Cybermen. It's not their super strength or the ability to move at the speed of light, it's the body horror that's always been the most chilling aspect, taking hold of a human being and threatening to turn them into machine. It's one the show's been desperate to shy away from ever since the creatures were first invented. This just feels like no exception. Furthermore, the kids are irritating, the characters feel like vacuums despite the best efforts of the cast, who are utterly wasted here, and for completely misfiring the Cybermen, Nightmare in Silver will go down as one of the Silver Giant's worst outings. Number 35. The Curse of the Black Spot. A throwaway adventure with far too many faults to be a memorable episode, The Curse of the Black Spot fails to match up to the quality of previous pirate stories and makes these buccaneers downright boring. There is too much reliance on storybook cliches, the direction is boring and lacks the gumption of a real swashbuckling adventure. There's a real sense that the budget cannot quite pull this cinematic concept off. Clearly all the money has been spent on the season opener. Matt Smith feels perfectly at home in this setting and Hugh Bonneville is good as Captain Avery, but... It's very disappointing of how Amy and Rory are characterised here. The episode lurches into a very different story about half an hour in, and it takes all the potential threat of the siren and gives it the most clinically unsatisfying payoff imaginable. There's really not much to say here. This is just a completely dispensable mess. Number 34. Let's Kill Hitler. Yeah, the title is cool. Amy does nothing with the premise. Debuting the second half of series 6 with the revelation that River Song is Mel's, a character we've never seen before but is supposedly Amy and Rory's best friend, is so earth-shatteringly stupid I'm surprised anyone approved of this. We spent three years figuring out the mystery of River Song and she used to be someone we never met before. How will I contain my excitement? The episode doesn't even feel like a story, it only seems to exist to introduce the Tesselector, a shape-shifting robot that I'm sure in no doubt is going to be the finale's cop-out. How exciting. Let's Kill Hitler is packed with good ideas, but misses pretty much every emotional beat and ignores so many important questions. How has Amy given up on the idea of experiencing her baby's childhood? Why would River give up all of her remaining lives for a man she's just met? What are the emotional consequences of that? How do Amy and Rory feel about spending their childhood in the dark about Mel's? It's caught in the middle of a spider's web of a narrative arc like a little fly struggling desperately to entertain and look hip to disguise the fact that a lot of what Moffat is presenting doesn't actually come off if you give it some thought. There really isn't much to this one. Number 33. The Rebel Flesh and the Almost People. Some stories of the revived era I can point to and say, if only there was an extra episode to flesh all this out. And then there's two parters like this one where I wonder why we needed two episodes to tell this story. The story is crippled immediately by a lack of identifiable characters, None of the human guest cast appealed to me in the slightest, so there's no hope left for the gangers. Jennifer in particular is just a hopeless character, atrociously performed and characterised and dragging Rory into a dead-end subplot that makes him look more like an idiot than a hero. Had all this been condensed down into one frantic episode, it might have been made to work, but up to an hour and a half, it plays the same tricks over and over until a naff monster effect and paranoia seem uninteresting. Another damaging factor is the direction and editing. Some scenes that should have flowed beautifully are discordantly chopped together, and there are an amazing amount of scenes with agonisingly long pauses, as if they are asking us to pass judgement on how boring this all is. The twist ending is cool, yeah, but that's not enough to save the prior 90 minutes. Rebel Flesh and the Almost People is a mess of a two-parter that collapses into a gelatinous mess the more it goes on, and I only want to forget about it. Number 32 snowmen. I never really had the best relationship with the snowmen, as I understand this is a popular Christmas special, but I can't say I'm a fan. 
Stephen Moffat usually takes everyday objects and makes them scary, but he really wasn't able to with this episode, as they come across as zippy from Rainbow as opposed to anything scary. The special feels like it's running on artifice, with plot elements happening not for any natural cohesion, but because the plot requires them to. We could have had a Victorian governess as our new companion, but it's a shame that's thrown out of the window for the sake of an impossible girl arc. Richard E. Grant and Ian McKellen feel wasted. The whole Christmas episode just feels remarkably unspecial. I can't say I'm a fan. Number 31. The Bells of St. John. Yep. It exists. Number 30. The Wedding of River Song. Prime example of the best and worst that Stephen Moffat has to offer as a writer. The first half is fantastic, with gorgeous imagery of time going wrong and all happening at once, the Doctor accepting his own mortality, the death of the Brigadier. All of this is amazing. Then the second half occurs and it's painfully dull, with the finale beating us over the head with information that we already know. Seeing Amy and Rory get back together when we know this will happen, and a final twist that just makes the entirety of the series feel like a huge waste of time. It frustrates me to no end because the Wedding of River Song started so magically until it fizzled out into artifice and cop-outs. One of the biggest casualties of the 11th Doctor era, if you ask me. Number 29. The Beast Below. You know Series 5 is a strong series when its bottom story is merely okay. The Beast Below is crying out for more time and a slower pace and to explore its ideas and to fill in some very important details and iron out our understanding of this world. The idea of Starship UK is great, but the realisation, both on the page and on screen, don't leave much to be desired. It needed a bigger budget to bring its ideas to life and more of a chance for its guest stars to shine. It just feel wasted here. It should have been superb, but it's frustrating and vague, selling itself on half-baked emotional moments. Our cool ideas about humanity torturing a creature of beauty for the greater good. It raises the questions. This is a society that can design buttons that can have a radical effect on your memory, but is completely in the dark when it comes to building an engine to free the star whale from its responsibilities? The episode as presented isn't given enough depth to suggest a greater meaning like this. If 1% of the population protests the ship would stop, how is that kind of any democracy? Surely 1% would be the minority, right? Polling booths are an unsubtle metaphor for the government suppressing information, and while I get the sense the Beast Below is trying, it just needed way more time to flesh its ideas out. Number 28. Angels Take Manhattan. The episode is trying its hardest to give Amy and Rory a great emotional punching send-off, and the final scene is terrific, but once again, this episode suffers from its 45-minute format. The first half of this episode is typical Moffat madness. We're leaping from one location to another, packed with knowing narrative tricks, and trading character drama in favour of over-processed plotting that doesn't feel like it's in aid of anything. However, the sense of unease we get from the fact this won't end well for our companions is handled exceptionally well, even if I'm just scratching my head as to why the Doctor couldn't just meet Amy and Rory outside of New York in the 1930s and pick them up, but regardless, Angels Take Manhattan isn't completely unwatchable, Whilst the Weeping Angels may have lost their scare factor, me and Rory's exit is done very well. There's a lot holding this episode back from being one of the greats. Number 27. Time of the Doctor. The finale for the 11th Doctor is a perfect example of having its heart in the right place, not its head screwed on properly. The Doctor defending a town until his dying day is a terrific idea for a regeneration story, and completely in line as to what the Doctor would do. Sadly, the rest of the special is bogged down by trying to tie up three years worth of story arcs and feels like a whole series worth of storylines was crammed into one 60 minute special that is just fit to burst. But I'm honestly quite torn on this one. On the one hand, Matt Smith is giving it his all for his final performance as the 11th Doctor and his last words are utterly beautiful. But on the other hand, it gives us elements we've already seen before. A mysterious woman who knows all about the Doctor and all his greatest enemies converging for an event, which could have been meaningful, but it just feels trite and redundant at this stage, in, at least in terms of execution. Being an emotionally frustrating finale for the 11th Doctor, the time of the Doctor both awes and frustrates me. Number 26. Victory of the Daleks. Hey, remember when the Paradigm Daleks were the most controversial element of the Moffat era? Oh, how the days were early. If any story was begging to be a two-parter, it was this one. 
Focus part one on the Daleks pretending to be benevolent. The cliffhanger is the new Daleks and part two does everything to show us what the new paradigm Daleks can do and justify this huge change. Sadly, everything here is crammed into 45 minutes. The redesign of the Daleks never bothered me too much. It's just the fact that they did nothing with them. I know it was only their first appearance and you don't want to reveal all your cards too soon. But you have to give the audience something. As the most these new Daleks do is shoot down two Spitfires and that's kind of it. Heck, the Paradigm Daleks were so underused that this is the only TV appearance of the Orange Scientist Dalek. Seriously. Victory of the Daleks isn't a total write-off, but for rebooting the Daleks that ultimately went nowhere in the long run, it's not going to rank high in my Dalek stories. Number 25. Name of the Doctor. I'm split into two people whenever I watch this story, and neither of them can decide on a verdict. There's the fanboy in me who thinks that Stephen Moffat has written a script that is full of strong ideas, memorable set pieces, and offers up nostalgia into the Doctor's past at the end of Series 7 so that the 50th anniversary special can look to innovate the future. And then there is the nit critic in me that can see on first viewing that this story poses more questions than it does answer. It's hideously overplotted with whacking great holes treading through that fails to give a reasonable answer to some massive clangers that have been poisoning Series 7. Well, it's not completely unwatchable, but if you start to think about the details of what Moffat is proposing for half a millisecond, it does fall to pieces, like a brilliantly realised construct that has been assembled with the instructions. Frankly, it is a bit of a mess when examined, but it is salvaged by a strong production from jaw-dropping moments in the presence of the previous Doctors. I would hardly call it the masterpiece that so many were declaring at the time, including myself, but it isn't the disaster that others have claimed either, like a lot of Series 7 B. The name of the Doctor is a massively flawed piece of work. It has more impact than any of the others because of the implications of its revelation. It's a nice appetite wetter for the 50th anniversary, but I doubt it will be remembered as one of the greats. Number 24. The Power of Free. I'd really like to applaud Chris Chibnall for showing how Amy and Rory's lives changed since becoming passengers of the Doctor as opposed to full-time companions for Series 7A. Oh wait, I'm supposed to hate Chris Chibnall because I'm a YouTuber. But regardless, The Power of Free is a nice scene setter for the Pond's departure. It's quite timely that we should get this close to them and enjoy lovely moments exploring how close they have become to the Doctor and the effect that he has had on their lives over the past couple of years. There are some really effective moments in here, and it's tragic that the Ponds should make such an exciting choice just before their departure. And everything surrounding the cubes is done really well, from the comments on society, how we initially panic, and then adjust, and then just start to utilise them. Their freaky abilities right down to the look of them gathered all over the world, just watching and waiting. The idea of a slow alien invasion is a terrific idea, and Kate Stewart makes a strong first appearance here, and Gemma Redgrave is still going strong in the series. Sadly, what stops the power of free for being truly exceptional is the ending. It's incredibly rushed, and the fact that it's all resolved so quickly leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Regardless, the first two acts are incredibly strong. They make me realise how much I was going to miss Amy and Rory. They truly were the power of free for the 11th Doctor era. Number 23. Night Terrors. This is what Fear Her should have been. Becomes so powerful that he's able to send a call for help across the universe into the TARDIS, the Doctor, Amy and Rory come to investigate. The doll's house setting is wonderfully creepy and the peg dolls with the motionless eyes are guaranteed to cause nightmares. Night terrors are certainly strong on atmosphere and frills. Sadly, its revelations do bog it down as this could have been an interesting insight into the fear of children, but the revelation that, oh, your kid is an alien, just feels cheap and should have been more relatable to kids as opposed to a pretty cliched resolution. Night Terrors is still a comforting watch for me that certainly deserves another look from fans. Number 22. Closing Time. Setting the stage for the Doctor's impending death in the finale, Closing Time is a comforting, nostalgic watch. The Doctor and Craig once again make a great comedic duo, and Craig's struggling to be a dad is a nice evolution from what we saw in The Lodger, and doesn't feel like repeat. This is a lighter episode with more lighter elements at hand, and I think they're handled exceptionally well. The Cybermen may feel like an afterthought, but there are some nice shots of them being worn down and in dimly lit corridors, and you get the sense these are a group of survivors slowly but surely rebuilding their forces. Cybermats are given a great reintroduction and update for the new series, and the scene where Craig is to be converted is terrific. I only find it a shame that they weren't gutsy enough to kill him off. 
The Cybermen have had many weaknesses over the years, some sensical and some nonsensical, but being defeated by fatherly love really does take the biscuit in terms of nonsense. Nevertheless, for being a lighter episode amidst all the story arcs of Series 6, closing time is a comfort watch for me. Number 21. Cold War The goal of Cold War was to bring the Ice Warriors back for a new generation, and for the most part, they pulled it off. Skaldak is gorgeously realised, the look of the armour is beautiful, and everything about it is perfect. Nicholas Briggs gives Skaldak an air of terror, convincingly sounding like a fallen, experienced veteran. Cold War takes the formula of a base under siege story and has fun with it. Now, I can understand fans wanting something a bit more, but for being an entertaining new series debut for the Ice Warriors, Cold War is perfectly comforting viewing for me. Number 20. Crimson Horror Being the Paternoster Gang time to shine was a great idea. The Crimson Horror is probably the closest we'll get to a TV spin-off with these characters, and they all shine really well here. All very entertaining, and with each mad twist and turn, balmy visual and trendy framing device, I was ticking off my reference list with increasing glee whenever I watched this. The first 15 minutes were a joy to see, bringing Madame Vestra, Jenny and Strax back to the fore, and for a long while keeping the Doctor out of the action. While it may be a bit messy in areas, with Mark Gatiss desperately wanting to squeeze a classic series comedy horror four-parter into 45 minutes and having to rush through all the important bits so he can get to the fun stuff, preferring the iconic moments over telling a decent story. It was gorgeously shot, the flashback reveals everything you need to know about the problem with this one episode format, squeezing an entire first episode from the classic series into a few minutes worth of stuttering development. The pacing of the Crimson Horror was relentless, and it kept throwing new ideas and pleasing images right up until the end, but it is easy to be bewitched by its many charm, although it climaxes on a pretty brainless confusion of action, and leaves quite a few important questions unanswered that shows that the script wasn't properly scrutinised in the development process. How did Missy Gillyflower figure out how to build a rocket? What was her motive for wanting to destroy the human race? It just feels a bit cloudy. Nevertheless, we were damn lucky to get Dame Diana Rigg herself as our antagonist for this episode, and for wearing its homages like a badge of honour, the Crimson Horror is a fun way to spend 45 minutes in an otherwise lacklustre series. Number 19. Hide. A small but effective cast, plenty of atmosphere, clever ideas, and a story that confidently strides from one genre to another, Hyde is by far one of the strongest episodes of Series 7, and the one which embraces the essence of the show most famously. It's a script that keeps developing and throwing fresh ideas at you, from the time travellers stretched across a moment of time to the Doctor's jaunt through the timeline of the planet Earth, to Clara's banishment from the TARDIS, the clever paradox resolution through the advent of love, and Neil Cross handles the concepts like a really masterful craftsman. It's an exceptionally busy tale, but never feels rushed, and one which feels like it's going to end with lots of questions hanging, ultimately resolves itself in a very satisfying manner. While it may be busy in areas, Hyde certainly ranks as a great horror story for the 11th Doctor. Number 18. A Town Called Mercy Definitely the episode that has grown on me most over the years. A Town Called Mercy is an excellent drama, and the first episode in Series 7 with a sustainable narrative that doesn't have to resort to smart tricks to tell a story. The Doctor can't hop about through time or set up the plot via a myriad of locations. He's stuck in one place in a difficult situation and is forced to think through his actions and morality. It is a refreshing change of pace, and as a result is one of Matt Smith's most impressive performances as the Doctor. He's funny, he's thoughtful, he's dramatic... So playfully obeys the conventions of a Western, but puts a pleasing science fiction spin on most of them, and almost uniquely in Doctor Who these days, there is more intelligent dialogue than there is spectacle. It's gorgeously shot, there's a great score from Murray Gold, there's drama, excitement and memorable performances. A Town Called Mercy certainly has the whole package, and is an episode that definitely deserves another look. Number 17 the Vampires of Venice. The addition of Rory Williams officially into the main group is a very welcome one, as Arthur Darvel is the emotional core of this story and the big highlight performance-wise compared to other actors. He's extremely likeable but struggles with the new status quo and setting around him. You can still tell that there's so much more to him than me in the way that he stands up to both friends and villains for what he feels is right and what is owed to him. 
He's easily New Who's strongest male companion by a wide margin, in my opinion, and allows natural conflict to arise between him and the Doctor, and he isn't immediately caught up in the wonders of time travel and the fantasy of all this like Amy was. Hammer horror imagery is gorgeous as well, add the Croatia location work, and whilst I'm not a fan of the fish people, the vampire elements are well handled, and Helen McCrory is a very enjoyable villain. Vampires of Venice is a strange New Who story, even with the confines of its own era examining the tropes of the past while also purging them in an effort to move forward and keep things unique and fresh. The plot is one of the weakest of the season overall, combining several overused tropes and ideas into an odd mishmash, and it's hard to say the character work and development is entirely perfect, but with a great Italian atmosphere and strong performances from some of the mains, particularly Arthur Darvel's Rory, whose inclusion is brilliant and very much needed after the events of the prior story, it's definitely a fun watch, and at the very least a memorable first outing for this TARDIS trio. Number 16. Dinosaurs on a Spaceship A prime example of Doctor Who letting its hair down and just having fun with a title like this, and it certainly doesn't disappoint. Dinosaurs on a Spaceship is bursting with gorgeous ideas, almost as if Chibnall has finally been let off a leash and allowed to let his imagination run riot. The exotic design of their spaceship is awesome, it feels very classic Who to film the Doctor and friends having fun on a beach and pretending it's the engine room of a spaceship powered by an ocean. As the Doctor says, it's quite ridiculous, but also brilliant, and it strikes me that most of the best ideas to come along in Doctor Who could have had that slogan tagged to them. And whilst I'm on the subject of great designs, the Silurian art looks unlike any spaceship we've ever seen, and it's all the more impressive for it, and the inclusion of Rock Priest Dad Brian is terrific, and while it may not be the most thematically rich or deep, Dinosaurs on a Spaceship is just a fun watch from start to finish. Number 15. The Rings of Akaten I am baffled this was voted in the bottom 10 in Doctor Who magazine's 50th anniversary poll, when for me this episode encompasses everything that makes Doctor Who so special. It manages to be a self-contained 45-minute story that does its job well. I think The Rings of Akaten is the perfect example of the strengths and the limitations of what the show can achieve at the moment. All the CGI featuring the rings and the pyramid look incredible, and it's hard not to get swept up by that kind of visual majesty, unless you're quite cynical. It's so wonderful that we get to meet so many different types of aliens, but perhaps we could have concentrated on one or two really good ones rather than what feels like hundreds of merely adequate ones. However, the speech given by the 11th Doctor at the end is nothing short of wonderful and perfectly sums up the 11th Doctor's character, an old man in a young person's body that was flawlessly brought to life by Matt Smith. Clara gets a proper chance to shine here and the scene with Mary is fantastic when she's not bogged down by the impossible girl arc. Things of Akaten may not be perfect, but easily ranks as my favourite story from Series 7, and it deserves another look. Seriously, if you think this is worse than Warriors of the Deep, maybe have another look at it. Number 14. Hungry Earth and the Cold Blood Chris Chibnall was given the task of reintroducing the Silurians for a modern audience, and for the most part he succeeded. As controversial as Chibnall's interpretation of the Doctor is in his own era, he absolutely nails it here. The Doctor is goofy, charming, but also intensely wise and authoritative. And this is Matt Smith's want stronger performances, providing such a range of emotions. His motivations and advocation for peace drives him to total anger in the ending of the story. He tries so hard to find common ground between the humans and Silurians, but it blows up in his face in the biggest way possible. Not only are the Silurians forced back into hibernation, but he ends up losing Rory as well, all from his own curiosity. This is a story where these characters aren't perfect, they're flawed and make so many mistakes, and the Doctor isn't exempt from this. He lets Elliot go, making him responsible for his abduction, and he wastes time investigating the crack which leads to Rory's death. These characters feel far more interesting once they're liable to mistakes like these, building to his guilt. Added to the guilt from previous encounters with the Silurians where they end up dead again, he's determined not to let this happen. It's really interesting watching this episode with acknowledgement of the Silurians and other stories of the classic era, because it adds so much more to the Doctor's motivation. The moral dilemma is well presented, as the Silurians aren't one-dimensional bad guys, but they're creatures with understandable motivations, and even the humans aren't flawed either. The story marvellously shows that neither side is perfect, Overall, this is a great two-parter, packed with fascinating characters and a really compelling plot. Chris Chibnall understands the Silurians so well, and it was a great choice to bring them back in this way. I think this is a really underrated story, and certainly deserves more love. Number 13. The God Complex 
There's a lot to love about this story for being such an oddball of an adventure and tackling themes such as faith and beliefs. It just goes to show what a creative director can bring to the show because with its single location and monster, this is clearly the cheap episode of the year. But cut together this fast and cleverly, it is extremely easy on the eye and the time flies by. It's a clever premise that allows for moments of psychology, some really bouncy dialogue and a wrenching twist at the end that knocks the Doctor for six. It really does seem that all of his personality flaws are catching up with him and they're vocalised in the God Complex. And to round off this character assassination, the Doctor realises that he has completely misjudged the situation and because of his advice, two and possibly three people end up losing their lives. No wonder he decides to set Amy and Rory up in a nice new house at the episode's ending to keep them safe. He can see that proximity to his adventures can brew up a whirlwind of peril. And whoever's decision it was to make the story's location a gaudy hotel was a great call. Because within seconds, it's such an instantly recognisable setting. But filmed in such an off-kilter fashion, it becomes something far more sinister, like something out of The Shining. It is that horrid pattern carpet and the fact that all the corridors look the same, and it's so depressingly normal but jarring in context to the story as well. For having one of the best guest characters of series 6, The God Complex will stand as one of the most innovative stories of the 11th Doctor era. Number 12. Impossible Astronaut and Day of the Moon Kicking off the series with the death of the main character may be playing your cards too early, but this two-part proves to be just as strong throughout. Whilst the pacing may be off for the first episode, the second episode is great. Taking the alien invasion premise and twisting it as a revolution is a great idea, and the ending is just the perfect chef's kiss to this type of story. The silence were a wonderful creation, editing themselves out of your memory as soon as you look away, and is a great idea, and the use of increase of tally charts is a chilling use of visual storytelling. All four leads get a chance to shine, and it's just an infectious watch from start to finish. Now, why do I have a cricket bat every time I watch the moon landing? Can someone answer this for me? Number 11. Lodger. Proof that even the stories that were given the budget of 20p can be quite good. I never thought that Doctor Who could work as a blokey sitcom. Lodger is basically a freeway character drama between the Doctor Craig and Sophie, but it's far more sweet and amiable than you could ever imagine. It's Matt Smith's most eccentric performance in his first season, and there is a lot of comic potential in the Doctor trying to fit in a suburban Britain. You wouldn't want to see this sort of thing too often or every week, but as an amusing one-off, it is a perfectly nice production, filmed with a delicate touch and featuring two warm performances from James Corden and Daisy Haggard. The Lodger is short, simple, sweet, and definitely enough to recommend. Number 10. The Good Man Goes to War Nearly 50 years, the Doctor has built up quite the reputation, and this episode attempts to deconstruct the god mythos of the Doctor. Good Man Goes to War as a mid-season finale ends up feeling like a hyped-up spectacle of everything that Doctor Who has been for the past season, and a half with a devastating finale that answers long-standing questions while leaving many more in its wake. But the drama hits when it needs to, the character beats are both extraneous and necessary, and they're some of the best of the season, and it's impossible not to feel what these characters are feeling as both joy and sorrow play their part and take hold. If you want to sum up the whole of the 11th Doctor era in one episode, this would most certainly be it, and it rightfully deserves its place in the top 10 11th Doctor stories. Number 9. Time of Angels and Flesh and Stone If Blink was Alien, then this is most certainly Aliens. Stephen Moffat has written a near-flawless script which is skin-crawlingly scary and epic in scope, and packed full of memorable characters who all get a moment to shine. It's one of the only times that Moffat has managed to pull off a really strong narrative and substantial character drama together during his era. Adam Smith deserves a medal for his avant-garde direction, the production is approaching movie standard, and there are plenty of delicious visuals and set pieces to feast your eyes on. The atmosphere is tense and frightening, and few Doctor Who stories are as dynamic as this without jettisoning their integrity, and it manages to feel traditional as well. The dark tunnels, the crew under siege from an extremely scary force, and it all feels uniquely New Who at the same time. And whilst I'm not a fan of the final scene, and seeing the angels move did cheapen their scare factor a bit, this two-parter superbly combines horror and action, and proved that the weeping angels weren't just a one-hit wonder, and is certainly one of the highlights of Series 5. Number 8. A Christmas Carol By far the best Doctor Who Christmas special we've ever had. 
When confronted with an old, selfish man, the Doctor goes back in time and manipulates his life. This continues the thread of the Doctor feeling like this immortal, unstoppable god. He's on a power trip and easily changes the course of a man's life without batting an eyelid, and doesn't even get challenged. I love that this Doctor spends more time around the children than he does the adults, introducing himself to them and allowing them to feel comfortable around him. It is one of the best qualities of this incarnation. Reflecting the appeal of the show, it treats its younger audience with so much respect. The late Michael Gambon as Kazran Sardik is brilliant casting. He brings to life such a complex bitterness to this character, a sense of resentment built from years of trauma and loss. Even from the start of the episode, there's hints towards a tragedy hidden under the surface, with the pain of him becoming like his father and never really knowing how to confront those feelings, leading him to regress even more. His chemistry with Matt Smith is fantastic, with both characters having this ancient authority to them that they play off each other so well. I love the subtleties with the younger Kazrans as well, child is still innocent and truly empathetic, wanting to be nothing like his dad, but as he gets older, he starts to adopt some of Elliot Sardik's sensibilities, such as not understanding how a poor family could be happy. The transformation Gambon gives this character from a tragic to old man, to a tragic kinder old man, is really special and unique, and the way he can easily switch between the two is a testament to his acting ability. The writing for this episode is phenomenal, with some wonderful one-liners and a truly heartbreaking character moment. You really manage to emphasise with all the cast due to how well they're fleshed out and explored. And in conclusion, this has very minor flaws, but it's such a wonderful piece of Christmas television. It's festive, it's sweet, it's magical, and it just has so much heart. These characters are written amazingly, and the way they develop over the course of the episode is brilliant. It's one of the best Christmas specials in the show's history, and perfectly fits this incarnation of the Doctor. Number 7. Doctor's Wife Neil Gaiman's episode is unlike anything we have seen in Doctor Who before, and it ticked all the right boxes for what I think can make this series so great. It's dark, twisted, imaginative, funny, clever, emotional, and satisfying. Another thing I love is that this episode looks lavishly expensive, and yet it doesn't pour its money into soulless set pieces, but where it counts, the glorious junkyard on the asteroid, the extra rooms in the TARDIS, the graveyard of TARDISes that we see, the dialogue sparkles, the ideas are brilliant, and the music is fantastic as well. This is the episode where the Doctor manages to build a working TARDIS out of hundreds of different models, and he doesn't care that it's impossible. This is the episode where Amy and Rory are menaced through the ship's corridors by a disembodied voice that eats TARDISes. It's the episode where the Doctor gets to talk to the most faithful friend he ever had and tell her how much she means to him. It is something to be treasured forever and is a perfect love letter for Doctor Who and one of this era's greatest triumphs. Number 6. The Day of the Doctor Celebrating 50 years of Doctor Who was no easy feat, but by the saints of Gallifrey did Stephen Moffat pull it off. There were so many wonderful reasons to embrace the Day of the Doctor, a busy, busy story having to live up to so much expectations. What we have is a gripping first 20 minutes, plenty of running about and larks for the next half an hour, impressive innovation for the show's mythology, and a shove into the future for the last 20 minutes and a massive love in the series at the ending. It's a story that doesn't just want to be a heavy drama, but wants to include sequences of levity and relish Doctor Who's adventurous roots too. It doesn't just want to celebrate the show's past, but it wants to hand the show a potential future as well. It wants to revel in the joy of a multi-Doctor story whilst yearning at the loss of so many of the classic Doctors. It wants to do pretty much everything it possibly can to see the anniversary in, and it is to the credit of Stephen Moffat that he absolutely pulls it off. There's so much richness and joy and horror and drama in here. Day of the Doctor is a compelling anniversary story that certainly lived up to the hype, and watching this in the cinema was certainly a treat. Number 5. Amy's Choice There is so much to love in this story. Dream Lord is a fantastic villain, and Toby Jones steals every scene he's in. This is probably the closest the 11th Doctor got to facing off with the Master. As much as I would love to see him return, he's so good in this episode that it would be hard to use him again without cheapening him as a villain. The way he taunts the Doctor, Amy and Rory is so well done. I love how much he gets into our characters' heads and makes them doubt themselves. The reveal at the end that he's the Doctor's subconscious really recontextualizes a lot of what we've seen, and it's an excellent way to end the episode. It also really highlights something I like about the 11th Doctor, and that's his hidden darkness. On the outside, Eleven seems like one of the more naive and childlike incarnations, but underneath all that there's a darkness that we don't see very often, but when we do it's clear why the Doctor is so scared of himself. The central dilemma of which situation is the dream is done extremely well. The whole time it seems obvious that the TARDIS is reality, but there's just small things that aren't adding up here. 
The reveal that they were both dreamed is a great way to resolve the episode, and I especially like the scene between Amy and Rory at the end. Overall, I think Amy's choice is one of Matt Smith's strongest episodes and an absolute highlight of his hero. Amy and Rory are written so well, and the way this episode develops their relationship is amazing. The villain is excellent, the plot is great, this is an episode I always love revisiting, and is one of the highlights of Series 5. Number 4. Eleventh Hour Without a doubt, the greatest debut story we have had for a new Doctor. Matt Smith had the near impossible task of following on from one of the most popular incarnations of the Doctor ever, and yet he manages to effortlessly pull this off, protecting those heroic, charming traits that are synonymous with the Doctor, while infusing his own boyish flair into it. It's a brilliant idea to introduce him alongside a young girl, highlighting his rather innocent, childish personality, and yet the threat allows him to step up and assert his authority. Instantly, we're offered a perfect encapsulation of what this incarnation stands for and represents a guide for a whimsical adventure, but always ready to protect you from the darkness that fairy tales can hold. His return to Amy's adult life could potentially be a great commentary on the audience, understanding that they've grown up and may want to move on, but the show, and the Doctor, is still the same, and it's never too late to enjoy being a kid, which is ultimately why it's a family show. This new incarnation is given plenty of opportunities to show off, standing off against Prisoner Zero multiple times, while simultaneously convincing Amy and the audience to stand by his side as he does so. Something that really interests me is the Doctor opted to bring the Atraxi back just to scare them off. It underlines how powerful he can be. For all the silliness he's performed while in this raggedy right at the end, he decides to don the bow tie and tweed jacket and show that he's much older and wiser than he looks adding the cherry on top to what this version of the character is like. He's certainly not someone you want to mess with and shouldn't let his juvenile charm fool you. Overall, for doing just so much right, the 11th hour rightfully stands as one of the 11th Doctor's greatest stories. Number 3. The Girl Who Waited By far the best story of Series 6, The Girl Who Wait juggles a lot the most delicate story elements you can put into Doctor Who, a high concept world, time paradoxes, and moral choices being the tip of the iceberg. It's remarkable that it all comes together to make one of the highlights of the 11th Doctor era. It was about time Amy waited a lifetime for Rory for a change. That dramatic irony isn't what the story is about. It is about loneliness, how alone Amy felt in this kindness facility, how she felt betrayed that the Doctor and Rory took away 36 years of her life, and what her motives could be for breaking out now. While this episode is meant to be a character study for Amy Pond, testing how much she can trust the Doctor and Rory, I believe Arthur Darvill is the one who absolutely nails every line he's given. We tend to think of Rory as a bit of a dopey comic relief, but episodes like this prove that he has an incredible range and can go on tough adventures, especially at the ending when he tells the Doctor he's turning him into the Doctor and has to comfort the older Amy as they leave her behind. I could never imagine another male companion pulling those bits off as convincingly, Karen Gillan is obviously fantastic too, having to play two versions of Amy with similar motivations, but completely different outlooks on the situation, and the fact that she insisted on playing the older Amy rather than be recast is a testament to how much this character means to her, and where she wanted to take her. Matt Smith is brilliant too, this is clearly an episode about the companions at what they can accomplish and how they can save the day on their own, and almost makes the Doctor the villain here, and that I think is a brilliant way of selling this episode. It's the Companion Spotlight episode to end all Companion Spotlight episodes, and one of the finest 11th Doctor stories. Number 2. Vincent and the Doctor One of the few pieces of TV that still brings a tear to my eye. It's awesome that an episode with such gorgeous character drama, and one that studies schizophrenia with such sensitivity, still has time for a giant invisible chicken roaming the streets. Visually, it's one of my all-time favourite Doctor Who stories, Every frame has been exquisitely lit and designed to provide a feast for the eyes, and some of the imagery is appropriately as dazzling as a Van Gogh painting itself. Matt Smith and Karen Gillan give their best performances of the fifth series, and it's Richard Curtis's treat to pair them to some wonderful dialogue and interplay. But the star of the show is definitely Tony Curran, who takes a potentially unsympathetic role and creates a Vincent Van Gogh who is entirely credible and great fun to be around, and before the episode he will have broken your heart by the end. Intimacy and chemistry between these three characters is extraordinary. Vincent and the Doctor will easily stand as my favourite historical episode ever made for Doctor Who, and I couldn't love it more if I tried. Number 1. Pandorica Opens and the Big Bang This may surprise a lot of you, but this is my all-time favourite story from the revived era, as the Series 5 finale encompasses everything I love about this mad show in a blue box. 
This story is especially beautiful in every sense of the word, divided by story and character. The Pandorica Opens takes all the clues and recurring motifs of Series 5 and brings them all together for a fantastic climax that has one of the greatest cliffhangers in Doctor Who history. I know a lot of fans like to dig at the second half, but The Big Bang takes all the character beats of the series and gives them a beautiful climax. Amy grows up, Rory becomes a man, and while River is still a mystery, they all still get time to shine here. Concluding Doctor Who's fairy tale season feels 100% earned with the powers of memory and love, which is what this season has been all about. Topped off with a timey-wimey approach to storytelling, and you have a modern day classic in my opinion. By far my favourite story of the Revive series for a damn good reason. And there you have it. That's all the 11th Doctor era ranked. Let me know in the comments below what your favourite stories are, and I'll see you next time for when we look at quite possibly the most versatile actor who's ever played the Doctor. I'll see you all then.